Hello and welcome everyone to the Capital Mind podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit capitalmind.in and if you'd like to invest with us, do visit capitalmindwealth.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Mind may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi folks, welcome to Capital Minds podcast. And yet again we discuss a topic uh, on uh, corporate tax cuts. This is going to be an interesting topic because everybody thinks this is a phenomenal thing, this is an interesting thing or some some of them say this is a bad thing. Let's go discuss this topic threadbare. We'll follow it up with a post at Capital Mind and uh, um would love to hear your thoughts and questions. So firstly, uh, you know, welcome Aditya to the show and uh, let's let's get this going. What's happening with corporate tax cuts? Hi Deepak, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure being here doing the podcast with you. So we have read a lot of details about the tax cuts from 30% to 25% and uh, reducing of uh, surcharge. So I just want to directly jump to the second order effects of the tax cuts. This is definitely not a, a consumption boost, right? This is not a consumption stimulus. It is basically uh, an investment stimulus or rather I would say that this intends to be an investment stimulus. So everyone is talking about how the reduced taxes will lead to more cash in the hand of corporates right crystal came up with a report that thousands of companies would save nearly 37000 uh, crore every year but my question is what are they going to do with this money so uh, they will either cut prices pay dividends or put up new plants right so but the point is do corporates have intention to do a capex right now because a lot of these companies are already sitting on a pile of cash be it uh, maruti or be it mahindra and mahindra the reason they there was no capex from their side was because the underlying demand itself was missing so what about the revival of consumption you can't consume without income growth right so these tax cuts do not do much for the consumption demand do they this, you know, this is a, <clears throat> there are two thought processes to how consumption comes about. In India, consumption isn't necessarily only personal. So, personal would be like demand for cars. Now, demand for cars, again, can come from two kinds of sources. When I create a new plant, uh, when I hire more people for that plant, I hire more uh, uh, workers and I hire more executives, I'm going to see a vehicular increase because all the people in that locality are going to buy cars, buy two-wheelers. The plant itself is going to buy vehicles, commercial vehicles, perhaps trucks, perhaps feeders, loaders, JCBs. So there is a knock-on impact of saying, listen, part of this consumption demand we talk about is actually investment demand that results in consumption. And what we are actually going to see here, and, and you know, I actually believe this is a very interesting and a very good use of the RBI dividend that the government has received, that uh, they will use this money to push investment and not consumption. I think consumption-wise, India's consumption has always been good. We will always have good consumption demand. The investment demand, which is specifically CapEx, specifically new investments and new plans, is mired in a number of data issues because what we call CapEx is usually just building of a new plant, buying equipment. But as we see more and more, people can actually start new businesses by just signing up for a shared rental office, buying a few bikes, hiring a few delivery people, and they have a business. They don't need a whole lot of space, a whole lot of plants, a whole lot of uh, things. So what happens is that uh, does not reflect in what is called the cap capital expenditure or investment or gross capital formation part of GDP. Okay. It records itself in consumption. So you will see a rise in consumption simply because even investment causes consumption. And that's not that's not a bad thing. Having said that, will this really uh, increase it? Let me look at this from another podcast we had done earlier, which was the rising cost of capital in India. Why will you do business in India if the safe interest rate that you can reach, achieve, is good enough for you to not have to run a business at all? Why would you do that when your cost of capital is so high that uh, it, is, uh, it is unviable to reach these businesses? 
when you increase the roe the roe is remember net profit after tax divided by the amount of capital you have invested in the business so if i earn a 8 rupee profit on a 100 rupee capital investment i make 8% roe if i uh, my 8% came after 35% tax pre tax i would have had to earn something like say 12 or 13 rupees today if i earn the same 12 or 13 rupees and i pay only 22% tax my return on equity just became 10 rupees out of 100 that means i have a 10% roe my 8% roe went to a 10% roe overnight simply because i pay a much lower tax rate so if earlier roe is now 8% is a is a misnomer most indian businesses work at 16% roes uh, in fact that is expected when a government gives a project that anybody who invests in this project will earn a 16% uh, roe or ro uh, uh, so if you look at that roe from that perspective and you reduce the tax rate a 16% roe can become an 18% roe literally overnight now if you were to say that listen we will pay these dividends to shareholders the answer to that is well that's money in the hands of the consumer the if they will otherwise reduce prices yes this money again in the hands of consumers who are going to buy those goods or people who didn't have the capacity to buy a certain good at a certain price now looks at this as an attractive offer and starts to buy it remember this is a consumption good so you can't delay it forever i can delay buying a car for 6 months if i see the car price come down and i need the car earlier which if it was not affordable i'll just go get and get it now saying you know what we've got a good deal why don't we just go in and buy it right now a consumption good when its prices fall its consumption actually increases and we've seen that whether it was mobile phones whether it has been uh, data connectivity or many of the others where inflation's actually been negative over years and yet we've got much lower uh, uh, much higher consumption than we have had earlier the second part of this equation is if you if they if the companies then say listen i will just make a lot of profits and i will do nothing with the cash i don't think that's going to happen because you know companies also look at this as if i put the cash in the bank i'm going to get 8% now it's falling it's 7% 6% every day but if i were to invest in a project now with lower uh, uh, taxes if i was a manufacturing plant it's only 15% plus surcharge 17% so otherwise it's 22% plus surcharge which is 25% it's much lower than me trying to do um, uh, a whole lot of other things so why don't i just invest in the business increase my capex and then <clears throat> wait as demand will come in this capex led investment cycle is a very interesting one in the sense that it spurs consumption at a later date the first thing that it does is creates new investment which results in the purchase of a lot of things we call consumption like cars cement uh, steel you're building new offices you're hiring new people you're giving people more money in order to be able to get more money after this and remember this is not just the big companies it's more likely to impact the smaller companies for whom credit has always been a pain and they are able to park their money um, instead of running a shop i might as well you know keep the money in the bank because what's the point here if net after tax i'm getting a much lower uh, uh, tax rate and a much higher post tax income i might say you know let's choose to run at the business instead and i get clarity at least that for the next 3 or 4 years i will not see that changing this is the investment consumption investment based consumption that i think india will see in the next few years and it will impact more the smes than the large companies and i'll come to why because uh, large companies get tend to take more of the exemptions uh which are available and now with the new 22% tax rate you can't take a lot of the exemptions that you earlier got or mat credit for instance which is largely used by big companies and not by smes so the small and medium setup is the one that really benefits from a tax cut the large companies not quite so much completely agree with you on the point of uh, investment based consumption but my question is what is the quickest way to boost demand put money in the hands of people So do you believe that cutting personal taxes would have been a better decision? I don't think so. I believe strongly that cutting personal taxes doesn't actually create a whole lot of uh, uh consumption demand from here it is. I'll give you an example. Up to 5 lakhs you don't have to pay any tax. Yes. That is a huge tax cut for about 95% of all registered taxpayers in the country. You if you provide a tax cut at the personal income tax level you will only benefit a very small percentage of population i'm not saying the number of amount of now a person 
that is say 5% of taxpayers and taxpayers themselves are only about 7% of the population so you're talking of 0.35 or 0.4% of the population will spend more is that going to change anything dramatically no but if one company decides to put up one plant it's going to hire 150 workers in order to just put up the plant i mean downstream it will probably affect a thousand jobs yeah, and each of those jobs produces incomes which are mostly below the taxable bracket but they will consume that money will go into consumption so you instead of saying that i'll benefit point 5% of 7% of my population i will benefit 10% of the overall population by saying listen 10% of population will get jobs maybe even temporary just related to my capex but this will happen in the longer term i will use this money i will spur consumption it may not result in higher taxes today but it will result in a lot of people who consume and then pay me the gst on consumption rather than income tax basically so, trickle down effects i uh, think this is one stage trickle down would be where you give the rich people money and they trickle it down to the poorer people here you are actually giving the corporates money and saying go spend on capex and uh, the you can think of the con- co- corporate as the rich corporate but like i said the biggest beneficiary is the shopkeeper the sme who refused to run his business because net of tax he was getting such low returns that you suddenly boosted his returns by 20% i mean i'm saying 6 rupees 8 rupees became 10 rupees that's a 25% jump in my net income after tax so by the way if you're a shopkeeper it actually makes sense to register as a private limited company today then to run it as a proprietorship because you save yourself uh, at the highest tax bracket that means about 10 lakhs per year you are paying 30% tax at the uh, even a shopkeeper nowadays by the way makes more than 10 lakhs a year or most likely 40 for 50 lakhs because he has multiple stages of businesses if you were to not declare them and keep them as black money that's a waste because you can't do much with that black money but now if he declares it it's just 22% tax or 25% tax which is much lower than he was paying earlier which is 35 36 and now up to 44% tax so it actually makes sense for people to move into private limited companies rather than just do things the way they used to do earlier so I think this will bring more people into the tax net in the in the future because the people who will register now will show it. And secondly, that people will start seeing that less of their income goes towards tax and choose to run it the proper way by running it through a private limited uh, organization instead. So I don't think personal income tax reduction would have spurred consumption quite as much. Basically, because our taxable net taxable population is relatively a very tiny one. uh 35 or 40 lakh taxpayers act actually pay tax um uh, versus you know the the knock on effects of uh, investment so uh, what about the fiscal math like this whole stimulus exercise is going to cost uh, about 1.45 lakh crore to the government uh, i don't think the government is so naive that it will allow fiscal slippage so do you see more divestments on the way like bpc of course i think not just bpcl but concor and a bunch of others in the government owned stakes in uh, you know itc and access bank and lnt i don't know about access bank but maybe um, uh, you know they they still do there is a significant uh, reason for the government to disinvest in these companies anyhow regardless of the fiscal math here but more importantly um, the fiscal arithmetic actually isn't imbalanced in a significant way i'll tell you why because if you look at what the government itself releases as revenue foregone uh, with respect to all of these uh, exemptions that people have been taking scz uh, say 60000 crores and now something else about 40000 crores so now if you take the lower tax rate you cannot avail of these exemptions and therefore those the revenue slippage on account of that will then balance itself out right so where i was losing 60000 crores in scz revenue tax revenue i might lose only 30000 crores and then for therefore my um, uh, losses which i was going to lose 1 lakh 40000 crores out of the the tax cuts itself now suddenly became 1 lakh 10000 crores take another another exemption out you lose another. so i think we lose a lot lesser in reality and because more companies will now choose to come into the tax net rather than stay out of it and will perhaps even declare income that they did not declare earlier in the medium term i'm talking 2 years from now we will see a much higher compliance because 
if more compliance comes more taxes come maybe this year is going to be little tight but they have the rbi dividend to to change itself for the next 6 uh, months but after 6 months again with the next fiscal year we will still have a significant amount of uh, rbi dividend uh, because rbi is going to continue to give good you know dividends not huge but good at least about say 1 lakh crores but apart from that you're going to get this business knock on effect of a the capex itself resulting in businesses that will pay more tax and also uh more gst through the higher consumption that's going to incur as a result but also because a lot of other businesses are going to say i'd rather be a tax payer than not be a tax payer and pay some tax now that some maybe a little bit but you see 35% you are always carrying away the small guy at 25% you have a greater chance of him being uh, you know accepting enough to pay taxes apart from this there going to be our businesses from abroad that come in and start to uh, do you know different things so as in they will start to set up their own plants they will set up plants for uh, 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 in for manufacturing in india because now the manufacturing rate is only 15% this starts literally on october 1st this is like right now and that uh will change the game as it goes on i expect more projects to be announced i expect more of these companies to come to india i hope we see lower uh, interest rates as well because the businesses once they set up they need to make sure that they earn enough roes after paying taxes remember if inflation is low and interest rates are much higher than inflation you can't really run a business so you need inflation and interest rates to be roughly equal or um, uh, you know ideally around the same level so that if you've got 5% inflation i should be able to borrow at 5.5 maybe 6 but i shouldn't be i shouldn't have to borrow at 12 which is the current situation today so i hope that happens as well just to i mean just that will balance out the fiscal math if more businesses come in so when we talk about manufacturing let's talk about the make india make in india initiative that was announced in 2014 so it was r- roughly about 5 years ago but i believe what they have done right now like 15% tax rate for new manufacturing firms is the real make in india push so i was reading a report which says that the average wages in china are now 3 times that of india so now with the ongoing trade war do you believe this is a very well timed move and we can compete with not only china but bangladesh and vietnam as well so i think with the without this move we would not have been able to complete because not only does bangladesh and vietnam have a structure that's more useful for people from abroad to set up plants but also that thailand and indonesia have actually cut tax rates and boosted local manufacturing through uh, in initiatives like uh, subsidies and uh, tax cuts also so we are literally going to have to do this just to stay in the same place the question now is whether india is large enough to be exciting for a manufacturer to say listen i will come here i will set up shop and not only will i serve the rest of the world so as an exporter but i also i'll serve the large indian retail uh, uh you know population so if apple were to make iphones it won't make iphones only for the world it will also make iphones for indians but True. indians can't afford them chinese couldn't either but now china is one of the largest buyers of iphones because their per capita income has gone up to a point where they can afford iphones if you have enough companies that come in our per capita income will go up high enough to be able to buy the same toys devices goods that these foreign manufacturers want to produce at a relatively lower price from the countries they currently produce in but they now get access to the indian market which they otherwise might have had to pay 10% 15% duties on india by the way has 10% duty on everything anything you import from abroad whether it's manufactured in china sri lanka bangladesh is a subject to a 10% minimum import duty and then beyond that there are charges and all that other stuff you manufacture in india you have no import duties so an importer will pay import duty plus gst so 28% uh, say gst for a car um or a car part by the way uh, even an air conditioner imported from uh, uh you know korea costs 10% import duty plus 28% uh, uh you know uh, uh, a gst so effectively you're paying 38% for it they have to manufacture at that much lower to be able to you know sell to india at a, a reasonable price so if you were to manufacture that air compressor in india i mean if it's a korean company i'd say listen i'll just manufacture it in india i will then be able to use that lower uh, 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 manufacturing base to even service the rest of the world because korea itself is becoming say expensive 
then i can't expand any more in korea so maybe i'll set up another plant in india that will service not just india but the rest of the world so this process might help the make in india initiative 17% is a very competitive rate very competitive rate so it's super attractive for someone to come in and say i have 3 years to build a plant 17% rate is is phenomenal now what this doesn't do is address the fact that these companies are going to come in and compete with indian companies who are doing the same thing mm that's so a, that's, a, that's the most this important this is part. actually good for us as a consumer because our consumption goods will help but it does mean that foreign co- competition will come in and perhaps because of their highly more ef- higher efficiencies they may be able to beat us substantially because of their much lower interest rates also abroad they could borrow from abroad set up a plant in india and pay much lower taxes here and therefore earn much higher returns on equity than than any indian company could hope to simply because their cost of debt outside of india is substantially low you can juice up return on equity by taking debt now in india our debt is 8% and outside the debt is 3% the guy is making the 5% differential more money that comes into india it keeps the exchange rate in check so net net somebody from abroad earns more money so yes this is a problem if it happens but i think it's a good problem to have because at the same time i think india should open up indian companies buying getting more debt from abroad so we can equalize the debt costs of this equation as well so uh, let's talk about markets Morgan Stanley and UBS both are turning positive on Indian corporate earnings and are talking about a cyclical recovery. This tax tax cut is a permanent thing; it's not a temporary phenomena, right? So, is it going to lead to a? Uh, re- does this calls for a re-rating of the Indian market as a whole? Because we would be seeing an ROE expansion and a profitability jump. Uh, we I think the ROE expansion is going to come primarily in uh, financials. and some in the auto sector as well because in financials you won't see people cutting rates because tax rates have come down rates roughly remain the same they will earn just higher net profits after tax many of them pay 35% now even if you look at the uh, uh, government data they also say that financial companies pay the highest tax in, uh, as a proportion of their of their uh, revenues uh, or of their of their book profits right so in effect i think uh, you know the market is going to get favored by higher profits in some sectors but look at it it a company like tcs for instance has so many subsidiaries abroad they pay tax in every individual jurisdiction mostly the us the us has 30% plus tax or now 22% recently so uh, there is a significantly low, different tax regime for them they have to pay the taxes in the jurisdictions they are have businesses in the indian business will only pay tax on income received in india so they will pay a lower tax yes but the impact for them is substantially lesser second they are located in scz's where they don't want to pay tax in india so they you like will locate themselves in scz's now they can't because if they do uh, they will no longer have any benefits to uh, to to be able to claim the lower taxation rate so they will pay the 33% but stay in an scz or like wipro whose exemptions expire uh they will move to another unit where the uh, exemptions no are 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 not there but then they're not there at the scz location either but it combines their operations into one unit so i think really that you know the conceptually the um the the move here from a taxation perspective will affect a few companies positively and a significant number of the larger corporates negatively another example mat credit you have something called minimum alternate tax and that exists because if you have 100 rupees and you have 100 rupees of exemptions you have to pay no tax because you have no income the government says no no no, no. let me back out the exemptions see how much profit you make 100 rupees then you pay 20 rupees of that as a minimum alternate tax but you say well i wasn't you gave me the exemption you know what take the 20 rupees put it in a reserve called a tax credit or a deferred tax asset so you say that this 20 rupees is available to you to use in the next year now what do you do in the next year you make another 100 rupees profit and now you have no exemptions because of some reason now you have to pay 30 rupees as a ta- profit right because it's 33% or 30 35 so 35 rupees you have to pay but you say listen i had mat credit last year i will take that mat credit of 20 rupees i will pay a tax of 15 the government says no 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 wait 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 
you have mat of 20 you can't pay 15 so you have to pay 20 at least the remaining five again you take that back as a mat credit so you took out out of your 20 rupees of previous one mat credit, you took out 15 you added back five so you have 10 left you know in a, in a way so mat credit keeps um uh you know getting uh, added up so uh, in this case actually five will be added but mat credit keeps adding up now if you have an exemption every year every year this mat credit is going to be added to your deferred tax uh, assets and you will have this huge deferred tax asset of say 7000 crores 4000 crores 5000 crores some and some of the large corporates have that much now ntpc for instance last year showed a huge profit because it has 7000 crore mat credit uh, uh, availability and because one of its exemptions had gone away, it had the same problem where it could use the past mass credit and it used it. Now, any company with a large amount of deferred tax assets or MAT credits will not pay 22% because it says, listen, I have to use this MAT credit. If I go to 22%, this MAT credit is useless because the law says MAT credit can only be used where MAT is applicable. And guess what is not applicable in the 22% tax rate? MAT. <laughs> there is no mat and the word the simple wording of the law that says the mat credit is not applicable makes sure that you can't use a mat credit against the tax payable which means any mat credit any company has today is a complete it's like toilet paper it's a it's it's completely useless you have to just throw it away if it's a large enough number i will say listen i'll prefer to pay 33 percent tax but please let me keep the mat credit so this is the uh, split. So a Biocon, for instance, may say, I am, I have research-related uh, tax exemptions. I don't want to take uh, the 32% uh, tax rate. Take Sun Pharma, take all the pharma companies. All of them have research-related expenditure that's exempt and you know, they don't want to do that. Uh, there are a bunch of others who have exemptions related to news industries, to petroleum exploration, to something else. All these exemptions are no longer valid. So you take the 50 companies in the top uh, or the top 100 companies in india at least uh, 25 to 30 percent currently pay less than this 25 percent tax rate which we mentioned so in effect if every company is paying 25 percent or i mean if, if many companies are paying less than 25 percent already they're not going to want to pay 25 percent many other companies that are paying more actually have some of these problems, MAT credit, this, that, uh, exemptions on research, SEZs, they will also not want to take it. So the impact is much lower than we think it is for the largest Indian companies, which is why I'm surprised that FMCG companies continue to go up because this is not going to spur people to buy soaps. It's actually going to spur people to buy cement. It's going to actually, and cement companies, by the way, pay a significant amount of tax. It's not going to push IT companies up, but IT companies went up in the market. So there's a, con there's a shift in congruence between what I think the the market should uh, react to, which is uh, you should actually be buying auto companies, you should be buying cement companies, infrastructure, capital goods, but on the other hand, you, and financials, but you should actually be shunning the ITs and the pharma companies of the world because they're not going to benefit quite as much from it. So uh, markets may have overthought this one perhaps. And I think we'll notice in the next few financial results uh, about which part of this camp is true. So uh, Nifty is up about 7 odd percent since the announcement. And uh, the mega caps are moving as if there is no tomorrow. I would rather say there is madness. Asian Paints is trading at a P multiple of 75, DMART at 115, Britannia at 64, and not just consumption stocks. Take Bajaj Finance. It's taking it's trading at around 12 to 13 times its book value. So my question is, why is this happening? Is it like suddenly the DIAs have been enlightened and they are willing to pay top dollar for quality companies, or is this clearly mispricing? Well, you know, in the US, there was a talk of uh, something called a Nifty 50 in the 1970s, early 70s. A lot of those stocks also traded at these ridiculous PEs. And people were told that, listen, these companies will never die. Okay. Just six years later, this a portfolio of a stocks of these 50 stocks, which was supposed to be never die, was down some 60%. Simply because, uh, not because these companies died and some of them took many years to die and some of them never died or actually merged with other companies and even became bigger. But the point was that when you overpaid for the valuation of these stocks at that time, you ended up having too high expectations. 
nobody would have thought britannia has to reduce the price of its biscuits exactly and now they do so all the thesis around oh this is a moat this is this this is that will go away dmart is a great example of a phenomenally run company but at a stock price where it's difficult to justify why you should buy uh, something like that for that kind of a pe because uh, if you don't if the company does not grow at a breakneck pace and by the way it's not growing at a breakneck pace it's growing at a certain pace which is decent 20 25% but you will not be able to justify 115 times earnings for it true uh, a bajaj finance one of the reasons why its stock price is attractive uh, to a lot of people is because of its growth but i say this you take a per- multiple of book and if the book value is 20000 crores you are giving it a valuation of 2 2 lakh crores it decides recently and it has to raise about 8500 crores that means its book is going to become 28500 at the same market cap the book is now instead of 10 times book we are now talking of 6 times book just by the fact that it raised capital will give it a 6 times book valuation so financials are a little bit weird in that perspective so you can actually reduce book value by just raising reduce book value multiples by just raising enough capital <laughs> bajaj finance has actually done that and it's it's quite interesting because i think people have factored that in when they gave it a 10 times valuation saying listen in 6 months this guy is going to run out of capital is going to raise capital so i'll give it a valuation based on how much i think bajaj finance will raise and it's going to dilute 4% but it's going to get a uh, 6 times book valuation versus a 10 times book valuation so there's a bit of a uh, uh, a dissonance over there having said that it's ridiculous to pay extreme values for a lot of stocks i think paying 15% as a for a, for an amc or 15% of assets for an amc 50 or or you know uh, 10 times book for our nbfc is a little scary Now, if you're invested, I won't say go and sell these stocks, but just be aware that the overvaluation exists, and you're the uh, children of a bull run in those stocks. <laughs> Not necessarily because you're extremely skillful, because in normal times you might not have seen such valuations, and uh, as long as you know that you're walking on eggs, um, it's easier to understand that you have to be nimble. That's a very good analogy. <laughs> uh deepak uh, my final question to you are the good times back for the portfolios uh is this the time when we start using the cash and the debt we had kept aside uh, till the weakness was over so i think anyone should should have an investment strategy that's longer term in nature and and you should have a very uh we should have a focused approach towards building uh towards your long term goals invest regularly if your income is regular if you are already invested or you have a lot of cash and you got out into cash earlier well good for you but i don't think it's the right time to say listen i'm going to bet the farm or the house on on all kinds of stocks i think you should buy good stocks you should buy them regularly buy build your portfolio over time don't push uh, the envelope but also remember that because this tax change affects small and medium businesses more the mid and the small cap should be the places where you start should start hunting okay um, and i think in the longer term that they will do well meanwhile we have a debt crisis on the books right now there is a potential situation with a number of banks a number of non banking financial companies housing finance companies this is going to cause the market to flutter and to give you negative volatility which means it's going to hurt you uh on the downside so i think keeping that cash in hand is still worth worthy because you can find deals where stocks are down 10% for no apparent reason and the stocks that you liked which you didn't buy because they were too expensive so a dmart hopefully it falls to three digits and then all of us can <laughs> buy it and say okay we finally bought into it but if it does happen it's a good thing and uh, i think cash should be retained in portfolios and only deployed over a period of time Thanks thanks a lot Deepak that was my last question uh, thank you for taking out time and doing this I think uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful thanks all for listening we are at capitalmind.in/podcast please uh, feel free to uh, uh, you know ask us questions on twitter i'm at deepak shinoy uh, aditya is at astute aditya and we are at capitalmind_in do check out capital mind premium where we discuss a lot of these things on our slack discussion channels with our premium members and uh, let us know what you think lovely and thanks for listening